Hello, everybody. My name is Edward Preston. I'm joined today with my partner in cybercrime, Tom Pace. Thank you very much for being involved in this webinar today, brought to you by Silence. Today we are going to be focusing specifically on Silence Consulting, and the title obviously capturing a lot of people's uh, interest, Hitchhiker's Guide to Ransomware from Genesis to Current Menace. So uh, we've actually done this webinar uh, on site in front of groups before, and we uh, welcome that opportunity, but this is a, a sure way to get out to obviously a lot more people uh, a lot quicker, and this is obviously one of uh, probably top three concerns for anybody in the information security industry, uh, ransomware. So let's talk about it, let's pick it apart today, and let's help you guys uh, arm you with information that some of which you probably know a little bit about, and uh, some of you here today probably need to know a lot more about, especially if you're trying to prevent ransomware from ever attacking your organization, whether you're uh, a handful of people or an organization of 1,000, 5,000, or 50,000 or more. You've got to prevent this because obviously uh, it does a lot of harm, a lot of damage. So today, we're going to give you the uh, the basics, but going to drive a little bit uh, deeper. In fact, Tom's going to do that. We're really excited about having the opportunity to talk with you today. We're going to be doing a lot more topics like this. Uh, I've been on board with science the last two years, and about uh, every other week we do introduction to our flagship product, Silence Protect. But today, we're peeling back and we're going to give a focus, put the crosshair specifically on to ransomware. So, uh, Tom, if you don't mind, if, go ahead and show the folks the agenda today. also want to make a note that uh, I've got John Vatz, our producer of today's webinar. He'll be actually providing a survey at uh, the end of today's webinar, so please stand back and uh, hold off for that, web uh, for that survey. So, here's the agenda today. We're going to talk about ransomware, tear it apart. What exactly is uh, ransomware? What are the actual infection vectors that you need to be aware of? We're going to turn back the time and talk about the history, exactly helping you guys understand how this little critter started and uh, bring you up to full current day, what's happening in today's environment with it. So a little timeline there. Then uh, Tom's going to talk about a business model for ransomware and uh, go into detail on uh, that. And then we're going to jump over and talk about infections, uh, what happens if you're actually affected or infected, I should say, by it. Uh, and then, of course, what are the ways to detect or prevent ransomware? That's why you guys are here. Uh, I'm guessing that there's probably uh, you or three people in your organization, you know, I should say your network that you know. Uh, a lot of people just go out and pay it, and that's not uh, obviously a solution. Uh, we obviously want to see you invest those hard-earned dollars that your corporation is generating and put those into things that will help you make money rather than to drain money. So, of course, we're going to talk about, at the very end, how can silence help? So with that, uh, Tom, how are you doing today? How's the voice? How's the weather? You ready to, you ready to roll? Ready to go. The voice is doing well. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so let's uh, just jump right into it. Uh, the, the one word, uh, that was the three syllables that scares a lot of people in the uh, world of the cyber cyber. Uh, uh, crimes that are happening left and right every day, popping up in the 6 o'clock news, and people are dealing with this. What is ransomware, Tom? Break it down for us. Sure. Thanks a lot, Edward. Appreciate it. So, you know, we like to lump uh, ransomware <clears throat> into a, a larger family of, uh, of malware known as extortionware. And this goes back to uh, the days of scareware and uh, fake AV, where essentially you would get infected with a piece of malware, and it would show you a screen that would basically say, you should install uh, this antivirus solution or what have you, or one potential uh, consequence might be that the FBI is going to come knock on your door. Well, back in those days, uh, the FBI certainly never came knocking on your door. Uh, nowadays, though, however, with the evolution of ransomware <clears throat> as an extortion tactic, you know, this is a legitimate, a legitimate concern that's going to have real-world consequences. Uh, the FBI necessarily won't be at your door, but you will lose access to your uh, critical company files, potentially family photos, tax information, etc. Um, another another type of what we like to call extortionware are basically denial of service attacks, where a attacker may threaten your organization with denial of service attacks unless you you know pay a ransom or provide them some sort of service or, or fee. Primarily, the uh, motive that we're dealing with, obviously, with uh, ransomware, is to you know acquire monetary funds to conduct you know, further criminal activity, or, you know, maybe just to buy something nice for themselves, uh, buy a Lamborghini. These people typically don't want to have normal jobs. 
So they're going to utilize criminal activity in the criminal enterprise to uh, make their money. And on the uh, right there, I just have an <clears throat> example of a pop-up of one of the uh, families of ransomware there. So, okay, so Tom, you know, everybody, they, they put layers upon layers and they try to, you know, do everything that they can. There's stuff on the market. There's stuff that's been out there for 10, 15, 20 years. Next generation solves Band-Aids, as we call them here. How does somebody get actually uh, infected? How does, how does, you know, what are the most common ways that one can actually get infected by ransomware? Sure, sure. And we're, we're going to cover that uh, as soon as we get down to uh, the uh, infection vectors um, portion of the webinar. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So right now we're just going to talk real quick about you know who is behind ransomware, and, and you know in the beginning it was people just trying to cause mischief on the internet, causing trouble on the internet. Uh, currently, this is overwhelmingly not the case, right? We're talking about sophisticated cybercrime organizations uh, that have found you know how effective ransomware can be in terms of making them money. So they're deploying this solution or this this malware more and more to uh, make them you know ever the richer. Uh, it's also, you know, very easy for them to determine if they can bypass legacy antivirus solutions and that's why they, they utilize ransomware so so effectively. They're able to upload uh, their, their malware to something like VirusTotal or other offline solutions that are similar to VirusTotal which allows them to determine the efficacy of their ransomware that uh, they're deploying to uh, people to protect, potentially infect them and, uh, you know, require a ransom from. So here's where I'm going to talk about uh, infection vectors and how the ransomware actually gets onto a particular uh, machine in question. So first I wanted to go over the basic uh, anatomy of an attack. Uh, so this is basically derived from the Lockheed Martin kill chain uh, that exists. Uh, it's, been, it's been tweaked slightly as uh, for those of you familiar with it. Uh, so in the first, you know, you have a reconnaissance which might be from, you know, malware markets things of that nature. Uh, then you have, you know, the weaponizing and customization of the malware. And then you have the delivery phase, which uh, is overwhelmingly going to be via a phishing email or spear phishing email, but can also be from a, a browser exploit or malware advertising, for example. Uh, then you have the actual exploit. So this is where the malware, you know, actually, you know, gains entry into, into a system via exploiting a vulnerability or somebody clicking on a link, etc. From here you have uh, the ransomware basically calling back, downloading new tools, or downloading more ransomware. Uh, then, you know, you have going down the kill chain, you know, credential harvesting, lateral movement, uh, data exfiltration, uh, sabotage of your environment, and then, you know, intellectual property, data being sold, uh, you know, essentially irreparable damage to your, to your organization in some cases. What you see below uh, in green there are various uh, artifacts that we're basically able to to gather and information we're able to gather to to assist organizations uh, in what's known as a compromise assessment to determine if they are compromised the level of compromise they they have encountered etc and we're going to talk about that more in depth uh, later on in the webinar so in terms of some infection vectors uh, these are fairly common and uh, should come as no surprise uh, removable media thumb drives uh, Web-based attacks, which could come in the form of a drive-by down downloads is a common attack. Uh, water hole attacks, where somebody would basically uh, hack a website that is uh, visited by a common group of people. So they would basically upload a file uh, to, a, to a website that they know a certain organization or group of people will access frequently. And then they will download that file and essentially infect themselves. Then you have malvertising campaigns which are, you know, essentially infecting ad networks which are so prevalent these days uh, that will basically serve uh, people looking at those ads or getting those ads delivered to them to download uh, malware. And then you have the number one culprit uh, still today, which is phishing emails. Um, and this can happen in links in phishing emails, uh, clicking on attachments, opening zips, and then double clicking on the EXEs inside. And so on the right here, I just have an uh, example of an email that is uh, quite fishy, um, that has many, many uh, indicators of it being malicious. Yeah, especially at this time of the year, right? I mean, everybody's uh, doing their online shopping. And I mean, look, I'm looking at all of these infection vector 
uh, types that you've listed here. And I mean, folks, think about this for a second. Your your remote users. Think about everybody that's got traveling, sales, marketing, HR, finance, all these different uh, departments within an organization. And they'll have a laptop. And they take that laptop to a location where they're trying to get a, a Wi-Fi connection. Uh, and, you know, they're trying to get a line and unfortunately they're going to the wrong spot. Or they could be inside the uh, inside the office and they're exchanging thumb drives back and forth, or they're on the wrong website, or they're opening up an email. Even you know, I just had lunch with some guys last week that all probably I don't know 14 years of uh, experience in IT, specifically security, and they could even say that listen, as as much as we know what not to click on and what not to open, um, they're still susceptible to it, just like anybody else is. So. I think what you're showing right now on the screen is these are all the, uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm in a, a metropolis right now. These are the uh, these are the potholes, right, that you have to look out for. And there's no way you can guarantee you're going to get from point A to point B without uh, getting a flat tire at some point in the year. So definitely a major problem. Sure, sure. Thanks, Edward. So in terms of uh, the kind of extensions that they're looking to encrypt, right? So this has changed recently, um, or has changed throughout the years. I'm just going to present, uh, this is a subset of them, obviously. Uh, there shouldn't be, you know, there's, this covers a large majority of the extensions that, you know, they're typically going to look to encrypt once they have successfully infected you uh, with ransomware. Uh, it's, all the, it's all the main ones, so you see a lot of Microsoft Office in here, you see a lot of media in here, you see a lot of uh, picture extensions. So basically all of the things that organizations and home users care about. That's interesting. And you know, the thing that's also interesting is how these hackers are getting better. They're getting smarter. Um, they've got tools that uh, have evolved. I mean, I see you got evolution up there. So uh, I think before we can talk about, you know, what they're doing today, it might be wise to maybe turn the clock back and kind of look at the history of ransomware so people can kind of see where it's been, where it is, and where it possibly should, you know, we'll, we'll probably most likely be going and obviously why people have to do something about it. You want to talk to us about the history? Sure. So the first, uh, you know, recognized issue of ransomware actually happened in 1989. It's known as the AIDS Trojan. And this was spread via a floppy disk that originated from a mailing list. And this mailing list was associated with, um, like, AIDS, AIDS research and provided information and things, things of that nature back in the day. Uh, the way it worked was after 90 boots of the system, the malware would hide directories and encrypt file names. And a, uh, a payment of $189, which seems like a fairly random amount, was required to be mailed to a post office in Panama. Uh, this utilized uh, symmetric encryption, which is, is not utilized uh, anymore in most of the ransomware uh, families that we are seeing. Uh, and obviously, things have evolved a bit since then. So here is a uh, just a, a brief timeline basically showing you uh, that the cybercrime entities have really gained an understanding that ransomware is successful. That's why you see such a proliferation in the various ransomware families these days. So you have 2005, which is, uh, there was a pretty decent gap there. I mean, other ransomware certainly existed, but uh, GP Coder was really one of the first mainstream uh, ransomware uh, families that came out. And then you have another decent, decent sized gap there until about 2012. And then once you hit 2013, moving to today, you can see that there, there's just a massive amount of ransomware that's being created. Um, you know, specifically, the, the very big ones such as Locky, uh, Tesla Crypt, uh, Zcryptor are some of the families that uh, a lot of people are, are fairly familiar with. So in terms so, of the current... The, yeah, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's not, what you're showing here is this timeline and how it's getting more uh, complex, yeah? For sure, for sure. It, the, the families have definitely evolved and, and just the, the, the number of families as well. It, it's different when you only have to handle, you know, two, maybe three different ransomware families. That, that's, that's doable. But when you're dealing with, you know, tens of families evolving and creating themselves on almost a daily basis, it gets very difficult. So here are just some characteristics of how uh, ransomware has essentially evolved and, and what they're capable of uh, currently. Uh, so number one is, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, encrypted communication with their command and control assets, so the servers. So they might use fast flux domains here, which are basically you know, randomly generated domain names that only exist for a short period of time. Um, and that 
basically conceals the source of uh, you know where the command and control activity is uh, occurring. And then you have the utilization of anonymous services such as Tor and Bitcoin. Uh, Tor stands for the Onion Router, and is basically a a way for people to communicate an anonymously or pseudo anonymously online. Uh, that allows them to talk to you know command and control servers or or other pieces of ransomware infrastructure in a quasi or a pseudo anonymous way. Uh, and Bitcoin is obviously the uh, anonymous uh, way of making and receiving payments uh, over the internet. Also, they have built in uh, anti sandboxing mechanisms to thwart detection. Uh, they're utilizing encrypted payloads, which makes examining the payloads very difficult or impossible for some. Uh, legacy antivirus vendors, and additionally, it's the the, the ransomware we're seeing is uh, becomes polymorphic, which essentially means that they change the code in a way that doesn't really matter in terms of the functionality, but it alters the signature and it alters the the ways that uh, security companies would use to detect the ransomware, but it's maintaining the exact same functionality. Holy morphic, I like that. There's the uh, million dollar word of the day. See if you can use that in a uh, sentence tonight at the cocktail party. So you said something about uh, anti-sandboxing. I mean, let's talk for a second here about uh, methods over the last five years that organizations, uh, vendors have put out in the marketplace, sandboxing, uh, whitelisting, behavioral analysis, um, exploitation. There's all these different, uh, shall we call them, detection methods. So, you know, they're obviously not working because you just said that ransomware is getting past them. What What's the business model? Let's get into it specifically with regards to how ransomware authors are, are so successful uh, with their model. What, what, what are these guys doing? How are they doing it? Sure, sure thing, Edward. So just to give a couple statistics to kind of start off, you know, it's estimated that CryptoLocker makes – approximately 30 million dollars every hundred days. I mean that's not a bad wow. payday uh, for sure. Uh, the numbers that we have found and uh, based on the research is for consumers so people just at home so your, so your mother, your aunt, you know your sons and daughters that are at home that get impacted by ransomware is typically 300 to 400 dollars is the cost to uh, acquire the decryption keys. For businesses it gets a little it gets a little flaky, and I'll have to use the engineering term. It depends, um, you know. It depends on the size of the business. It depends what data was encrypted. It depends on the amount of money that the attackers believe that the business has. Obviously, a large financial institution may draw a higher ransom than a local mom and pop hardware store, as, as an example. Um, and aside from the the costs that you have from deliberately paying the ransom, which can be significant. You have you also have uh, significant secondary costs associated. And I'm going to lay out a scenario here uh, of, of something that, that we have encountered before. And we'll just call this client, uh, you know, Pace Incorporated. Um, this client suffered a, a ransomware attack uh, at the same time that their earnings report was due. Uh, and this essentially impacted their ability to appropriately and accurately, you know, generate the report that, that was due. And, you know, you have SEC filings and, you know, stock forecasts and all of these different uh, things that are related to this earnings report. Uh, this is a publicly traded company. And so as a result of the earnings report, you know, coming out late, not, you know, containing all the information they had expected, the, uh, the stock actually ended up dropping 5%. Now, you might say that could come from a multitude of reasons, and that's certainly true. However, the stock was forecasted to jump around 10% uh, based on you know, market analysis and, and what the earnings report would have contained if it would have came out on time. And so that's a 15% deviation, which is, which is definitely significant. Um, also, you have if the attackers were able to double down on shorting the stock, uh, they, would, they would win twice. So there's, there's a lot that goes into you know, you know, how they time these attacks and how they, how they ask for a ransom. And then you also have the secondary costs of you know, responding to the incident, uh, loss of FTE time, if they encrypt things such as uh, your sales, your sales servers that contain all your client information, you can't reach out to clients, so you're, you lo you're losing time and money there. So there's a lot of secondary costs associated with ransomware as well. 
So in terms of the business model, uh, they're typically based on, you know, I, I read as much research as I could and, and talked with a, you know, a lot of different uh, clients and organizations. Uh, the ransomware authors are typically going to provide decryption keys to those paying the ransom. And uh, some organizations don't have that experience, obviously. And we're, I'm going to talk about some of the reasons that they might not have as well. So once the ransom has been paid, we as in silence have around a 90% success rate for uh, acquiring the decryption keys and, and decrypting the uh, encrypted files from the ransomware. Yeah, right, that's, where the repeat, that's where they're repeating. Let's just make sure you got that one out. Say that one more time. Yeah, sure. So 90% success rate is, is, is what we have worked with. Um, and it would be bad business if, 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 they, if they didn't do this. I mean, you, if you're making $30 million every 100 days on ransoms and you're not decrypting anybody's information, then people are going to stop paying you. Uh, that's just yeah. that's that's just a fact of life. Um, and we're going to talk about you know if you should pay, why you should pay, and things of that nature as well. Uh, so this is like my favorite uh, subject right here. So I've been to uh, Black Hat. We have RSA. RSA is coming coming up around the corner. All these trade shows, the biggest shows, smallest shows. We have lunch and learn sessions. All these you know conversations, whether it's uh, you know one on one or on the phone, what have what have you. And, you know, we're always asking people that are telling us, and everybody here needs to know that probably about somewhere in the low 80s, let's call it 82, 83 percent of the inbound conversations that we have, people knocking on our door have ransomware. So I always say the remaining 18 percent, you know, they haven't had it yet or they're not telling us or, you know, we come to find they have something else, believe it or not, that's even worse. The reality is what do you do with it? A lot of people, as Tom, you just said, are simply paying it. You know, there's a, a very popular three acronym uh, organization, federal one, that uh, tells you, and it was printed earlier in the year, uh, to pay it. And you know, we're we're here to say no, stop doing that. And of course, I think a lot of people have signed up for this webinar because they want to find out what they can do when they get it. You know, running to the wall, pulling the cord out, or as uh, another group of uh, folks told me last week, well, we have everything backed up. So we're not worried about it. We'll just reformat. Well, my goodness, how much time, energy, and cost is that associated with? So, lay out a couple of ideas. You know, what are we looking at here, Tom? If you if you get uh, you get attacked, you've got ransomware on the brain. What are you going to do about it? Sure. So the first thing you you want to do in most of these instances is check to see if the system is connected to any network shares. Uh, if it is, you want to document what shares it's, it's connected to. And then if it's just any, connected to any other systems in general. Then you typically want to shut down the impacted system. Now, there's, there's all kinds of deviations for uh, if you should do this and if you should not do it. But at a minimum, you want to disconnect, the, disconnect it from the network uh, and, and the Internet uh, in case you have multiple NICs on particular systems, for an example. Then you want to try and download the contents of any network shares. And, and I know that can sound like a, a significant undertaking, depending on the size of the network share. Um, and then, and then if you can't take the network share offline, because what you're really trying to determine here is, okay, they were connected to this network share. Did the contents of that network share become encrypted? And this is one of the way, the best ways you can do that. With you're gonna have to incur a little bit of downtime, obviously, with the network share. But this will allow you to determine if the network share has been encrypted, so that you can know how to respond to the incident appropriately. And then. Next thing you have to do is basically determine if you should pay the ransom to remediate the encrypted files. So, this this is a whole decision tree that you know we're going to kind of try and talk through here. So, number one, is there a master key available? So, is this Tesla Crypt or Crisis ransomware? Those master keys have been released and can be utilized to decrypt uh, all of the encrypted files that have been uh, encrypted from that those particular ransomware families. So, if that happens to you, you will be very lucky. Um, you also have online decryption tools. Uh, some of these work, but we, we definitely caution you to be careful because uh, you could they, they could not work appropriately and you could lose your files forever. Uh, but some online decryption tools do work. Uh, do you have any backups? Do you have uh, volume shadow copies or shadow copies? Do you have tapes of the data that has been encrypted and impacted? And then another thing to factor in is is the data that has been encrypted valuable? Do you, do you care about it? Do you care that uh, a user lost a, a few Word documents, for example? 
Now, if we're talking about things like trade secrets, intellectual property, uh, client information, uh, financial reports that you need, that, then that, that starts pushing you down the road of you know, wanting to pay the ransom. You also have, uh, is, it, is it worth the ransom asking price? Meaning, how, how do you measure the, the worth of your data? And that's, that's dependent on each organization and the data that's, data that's been encrypted. So if you have trade secrets, as I mentioned, you know, plans, proprietary software, you really don't have a choice but to you know, roll the dice in a, in, in, and pay the ransom. Um, also, can I get the Bitcoin fast enough if that's the, pay, the form of payment that they're looking to pay? Uh, sometimes you only have hours. Uh, we've seen a rough time frame from anywhere from six hours to 72 hours and, and more or less as well on, on either ends. Uh, another another uh, interesting thing that some of these ransomware authors are doing as well is um, attackers are threatening to publicly publish the information they found on your computers if you refuse to pay. So not only have they encrypted the files, but they've also exfiltrated the files out of your network as well, with, which basically acts as a double incentive to, uh, to pay the ransom. So these are all the various questions that you should you know, really ask yourself. In terms of you know, actually decrypting uh, the ransomware that's, that's been on your system, some of the issues we found, a wrong key has been provided, right? They, they provide you with the wrong key. The decryption process gets interrupted and, and uh, causes the, uh, the file to basically be corrupt. Uh, the, the application that is doing the decryption is poorly coded and the, the encryption is implemented uh, improperly. Software vendors that provide decryption services might not always work. As, as I mentioned, there's a few out there, uh, that, but they're not 100% obviously. Or this last one is that the attacker basically purchased the ransomware on the black market and they don't even have a, the ability to generate the keys you know, for you. Uh, one way to get around this bottom point, and I believe I'll mention it later as well, is you basically force the ransomware authors to decrypt a few files for you showing that they can prove uh, that they actually possess the decryption key so that they can decrypt the rest of the files once you do pay the ransom. So those are the reasons to pay. These are some reasons that you should think about when you, you know, to not pay essentially. So you have ethical dilemmas, of course. Is this going to enable more malware authors to leverage ransomware for financial gain? And we've certainly seen that to be the case, you know, perpetuating the cycle. Um, people have been concerned that they're funding terrorism uh, by uh, paying these ransoms. You also have reporting requirements. Uh, you have the SEC, the FTC, HIPAA. A lot of these standards are are, you know, adding language in about paying ransoms or getting infected with certain pieces of uh, malware uh, in the environment where they have to adhere to a, a particular audit mechanism or standard. Interesting. I'll tell you what, you know, just uh, that last screen alone, um, giving people a reason why not to pay, it's a conversation that I know a lot of people talk about within the organization, and it's obviously a very important one, but um, two quick notes, guys. Uh, I mentioned it earlier. I just want to reference it once again now that we're 30 minutes in. We do have a survey at the end. Tom and I certainly would appreciate it if everybody just take a minute of your time at the end and fill that out. Uh, John Vats will be standing by to make sure that gets pushed out to everybody. Also, uh, at the bottom of your GoTo webinar, I should mention this earlier, there is a section for sending a question. Uh, I believe it's referred to as a chat box. So. Uh, Tom uh, would most certainly love to uh, answer up as many questions as he can. We've got quite a number of folks here, so uh, we'll get through as many as we can at the end, and we're getting near that, so please find that box if you have any questions in reference to what Tom has already laid out, and we'll uh, do our best to get to those at the end. Um, so, all right, so now we're going to turn to options, the old prevention and detection, uh, different methods of uh, fixing the problem. Talk to us. How do you, how do you actually go about detecting and preventing uh, ransomware attacks using, let's call it industry tactics or, or best practices, Tom? Sure. So the number one way is obvious, and that is, you know, having solid backups. Systems, right? If you have solid backups and you get infected with ransomware, which you want to prevent in the first place, which we're going to talk about, you, you should at least be able to, you know, retrieve your data from your backups. So testing them, having good backups, hiring good people to manage your backups are all essential elements in uh, 
dealing with ransomware. Uh, network share user permissions should allow the least amount of access, which is a fundamental security concept of uh, least privilege. But you know, only give those users the minimum amount of rights that they need to access the information on those network shares. Uh, if possible, lock down your volume shadow copies. So what we're seeing is that ransomware is not only encrypting your, your files on your system, but it's also encrypting or deleting your volume shadow copies. So basically you can't retrieve the volume shadow copies for those systems, and so therefore it's another, it's another reason A, to have really good backups, and another way that they are forcing you to pay the ransom because they're getting rid of your volume shadow copies. Uh, you can also monitor for randomly named files, and this is common for, for all malware in, in, in reality. Uh, put into common malware directories such as you know app data, local app data, the temp directory, Windows, and then also for persistence mechanisms, you know, run keys being added, uh, adding files into the startup folders, etc. And these are pretty common for uh, you know most malware, but it, it, it's worth mentioning here uh, for ransomware as well. So the two things that are really important to focus on aside from backing up, and that's why they have them highlighted here are email security and user awareness training. So first to talk briefly on email security. If you were to implement a lot of these uh, mitigations I see on the right hand side, blacklisting, doing uh, sandboxing, which is it's not 100%, right? Uh, URL rewriting, uh, block EXEs, block zips, block macros, and block scripts coming into your organization, which a lot of organizations don't do. There's very little reason that most people in your organization should be expecting a .exe file or expecting a .zip file or expecting a, J a JavaScript uh, link or, or, or something along those lines. Allow these things by, by exception within your organization. Um, also, alert on password protected files. So a lot of times these zips will be uh, password protected so they can't be scanned or analyzed. That's a pretty decent indicator that, that what's in that zip file is malicious. So moving back over to the, the information on the left, user awareness training. So I know we hear it all the time, the user's the weakest link, um, but you know, having active phishing campaigns internally is a, is a great training tool. Um, utilizing tabletop exercises that focus specifically on ransomware, that's also gonna bring in your backup uh, administrators, uh, other, other silos within your organization to help with that tabletop. Conduct compromise assessments, which are proactive assessments to identify threats that we'll talk about. And then blocking you know, dynamic DNS, onion, torrent sites, and just these blanket blocks will be, uh, will be very helpful in preventing this from happening. Uh, these are some other ways that you can be prepared. So adding a specific process and procedure to your incident response policy for ransomware. So where's my nearest Bitcoin ATMs? Uh, the ransom payment decision tree, basically, should I pay or should I not pay? Uh, have the money already on hand. Create a Bitcoin wallet. So that way the funds are already there. Uh, it's up to you to determine the amount of funds you put in that wallet, but at least having the wallet uh, will provide you a level of preparation. And this should also be part of the BCP, you know, your business continuity plan. And this is a reason to invest in really solid backup solutions and really solid uh, talent as well to manage those solutions. So what we're going to kind of move on to now is We've talked about the things we can do from an industry standard perspective and how we can prevent and detect ransomware. We're really going to talk about how we can prevent it in, you know, using legitimate preventative-based solutions and preventative-based services. And that's going to fall in line with you know, Silence Protect and the Silence Consulting Services. And can I just say something before you, you go off on that, uh, on that path? I mean, here we are, perfect example. You know, it's the shopping season, right? Holidays are upon us. And, you know, you've done a fine job so far, you know, talking about where ransomware has come from, what, what uh, kind of pain it gives everybody and some of the decisions that they have to make. Right now, another decision people are trying to make for 2017 is uh, what new um, solution to put on board, whether it's a replacement, whether it's something to ride alongside with what you currently have. Folks, there's three options, and what you're going to hear Tom talk about right now is the third option. Let's talk about what number one and number two are. Number one is something that has been out in the 
industry for a long time that requires and is dependent on a signature. I'm not going to pick on anybody today, but there's a lot of big names out there that have been doing a lot of things for a long time that uh, this company has come along and kind of blown the roof off the place to tell everybody what's really happening inside. Number two is you've got some kind of a detection methodology. So think about right now, let's use forest fires as an example. Everybody's trying to, you know, I think the old saying, Smokey the Bear, trying to detect forest fires. No, 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 no. You want to prevent forest fires. You want to prevent ransomware. Not detect it. I want to prevent it. So hopefully this next segment, Dom, you're going to kind of take it home and talk more about how important prevention is over detection and give the folks at home a little bit of a taste on that. Sure. So real quick, I'm going to talk about the traditional response approach, correct? So one of your tools is going to detect something, uh, whether it be an IDS signature, an antivirus hit, a threat intelligence alert. And this is going to have you in a, in a, a reactive posture. And so some of the things you might do from a you know, traditional approach is you know, image the disk, image the memory. And this can take a, a huge amount of time and provides you with a huge amount of data that you need to analyze. Uh, so you're talking about you know hours to to image uh, hard drives. I mean, laptop hard drives, almost all of them have 500 gigabytes of data now. So to image that hard drive and then analyze 500 gigabytes of data takes takes a very long time to do. And incident response needs to be fast. Response needs to be fast. So the silence approach, and uh, for those of you that have been in incident response for for quite some time, uh, such as myself. I'm going to throw a phrase at you that's that's going to, you know, might shock you a little bit, and that that phrase is preventative-based incident response. You know, a lot of people, you know, will, will call that an oxymoron. So I'm I'm going to take some time here to explain how Silence uh, utilizes a preventative-based incident response approach. So <clears throat> if you look at the chart or the flow chart on, on the right-hand side, this basically outlines our flow for dealing with uh, incidents whenever we come into a given environment. Uh, so at the top there, you know, you have, we have phase one or P1, which is basically what's known as our, our hunting phase and basically encompasses uh, what, what is known as a compromise assessment. This, this allows us to acquire critical artifacts that typically amount to around two to three megabytes of data that get, that get uploaded to us that we are able to analyze. Based on that analysis, that allows us to basically determine the scope of the potentially compromised hosts within your environment. Once that's been conducted, we typically move on to phase two for those, those suspect systems and deploy a tool known as inspect. That tool uh, essentially is going to gather all of the artifacts that you would expect to have from a full disk image without taking a full disk image. And so to, to talk about that in terms of numbers, uh, anywhere from, you know, 20 to upwards of maybe around 100 megabytes of data and you know an hour an hour typically most to to acquire that data whereas you're talking about a significantly longer time frame to, to acquire data from a traditional response approach right uh, that data gets enriched uh, timelines are generated uh, that all gets um, our artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms uh, ran against it uh, from, from, from the executables to, to, other, to other elements and artifacts that we gather. And then phase three, if, if necessary, is, is basically, you know, the, the automated forensic self-collection if necessary. And this is where, you know, there are some cases for like legal purposes uh, where we do uh, need to take full disk images, but 99.9% .9 of the time we, we, we're, we, we don't need to take a full disk image or, or memory image to uh, conduct this analysis. And then this all loops back in, back in from the actionable results that we get from phase one and phase two back, that, back into phase one from the compromise assessment or the hunt phase. And if you'll notice, uh, there's one portion of the flow chart that's kind of broken out by itself. And that's the remediation and prevention phase. So for those of you familiar with you know, the incident response process, you have preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. Well, after most incident response engagements, they're not leaving you with a way to prevent and contain incidents moving forward. All they have done is maybe remove the incident that they called you for in the first place, maybe patched a few systems, provided a few recommendations, 
update this software, maybe buy this detection tool, etc. But they're not leaving you with a real way to prevent uh, a follow-on infection and contain those threats. And that's really where Silence Protect comes in, our, our enterprise uh, prevention uh, tool. So this is going to provide you with a containment uh, of the threats uh, via quarantine, but really the prevention uh, of those threats, right? Uh, the, you know, Protect has been utilized uh, in, in many of our incident response engagements, um, and it really is what provides us the capability to conduct preventative-based incident response. And some of you might be asking yourself, well, why would I do this at the end? Why would I deploy Protect at the end if I can contain the threats and um, prevent future threats from the very beginning? And that's a very fair question. And sometimes that, that is the uh, destroy evidence, destroy indicators of compromise, and then just come back. Because even though everybody knows we're supposed to change our passwords after an incident, that usually doesn't happen. And they can just come back with the same credentials they just had and maintain the same access they just had. And that's so we, li we like to understand the full scope and the depth and breadth of the incident before we deploy Protect. And that is why it's super important that the previous steps are fast. So just to talk on Protect for, for a minute here, some of the uh, primary characteristics. So it operates pre-execution. So we're going to essentially evaluate 2.7 million characteristics of a PE in approximately 100 milliseconds. Uh, and that's going to prevent the malware from ever running. So no behavioral, no heuristical detection at all. It's purely based on this pre-execution -exec, pre mindset. We also operate on the, uh, the principle of basically signatureless detection, which means we have very infrequent updates to our actual detection models that we utilize for machine learning. So a few times a year at most, twice, maybe three times. We also, uh, within the same agent, offer exploit prevention, uh, uh, cloudless protection, meaning it doesn't need to be connected to the internet for it to work. The machine learning model exists on every endpoint on each agent. And also script control. Uh, PowerShell has became a huge uh, malware delivery mechanism. Uh, as I mentioned before, JavaScript as well. So utilizing the script control has, been, has proved very effective for our clients. And then there's self-protection and very, you know, it's a, it's a very resilient agent, essentially. Uh, I just wanted to harp on real quick the idea of pre-execution. Uh, it's really focused around you know, this prevention uh, of the malware from ever being ran. This allows you to maintain the integrity of your system. These other tools that are detecting uh, malware after it's ran, you've already lost the integrity of your system. Uh, a a re-image is basically uh, going to be required for most organizations. Um, the malware is going to be prevented from running based on our machine learning algorithms. So no signatures, no reputational, no behavioral heuristics. As one case in point, we were uh, approximately six months ahead of the Z Crypto campaign, uh, which is basically to say we were preventing Z Crypto from infecting machines six months before anybody else even knew about it. Uh, our, our actual machine learning models that are a year old, some of them even older, uh, are still capable of detecting zero days from that exist now. A legacy antivirus can, cannot do this. Uh, esp they especially can't do it pre-execution. No, definitely not. So, so in conclusion, I just want to highlight these, these four points here. Um, number one is that you know, ransomware has evolved to become a significant threat to organizations, as I've mentioned, in terms of financial and, and you know, sec maintaining a, a secure environment and ensuring your, your stock price doesn't fall in some very significant cases and take a proactive approach to securing your environment because the attackers certainly are. Incident response needs to be fast, but you still need to have access to all relevant data, and that's why you know, Silence touts this, you know, this principle of least data and this preventative-based incident response approach, and then implement tools and services that are going to enhance your preventative posture, not your detective posture. If you can pick one of the two in terms of, should I prevent this or should I detect this? You should always go with trying to prevent the malware from running in the first place. 
and that's John, all that's, uh, yeah, that was that was fantastic. And I apologize if I'm spotty a little bit right now, based on I'm uh, in my, I'm in travel mode right now. But you did a fantastic job. I think you covered a lot of things. John, I know you're standing by. Can you help out with some questions that Tom can go ahead and answer? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Cool. So, one question comes from Jeff earlier in the webinar. He had a question about what percentage of Mac or what percentage of, of ransomware, I should say, uh, infects Mac versus Windows, and why? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the famous, uh, you know, Macs don't get viruses, that which we all know is not is not true. Um, so, I don't have that. I don't have that number in front of me from a percentage standpoint. But you know, much like other malware, there there's a significantly higher uh, amount of ransomware being specifically written for Windows. Th there are variants of ransomware that affect Mac for sure, um, but we're seeing a, a predominant uh, presence of of Windows-based ransomware because you know, number one, that's what most businesses are still using. Uh, you know, Windows operating systems. Are we starting to see a change in kind of like a mixed environment in a lot of organizations? Definitely, I think that that's true. And with that, I think you'll see a uh, you know a surge of of, of uh, Mac Mac based ransomware as well. But right now, I mean, I would say uh, the 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 great proportion of ransomware is still associated with Windows. Hey, and just one more thing, and John, let's keep rolling on the questions. Another thing I want to throw out there, obviously, this webinar has been focused on ransomware. Folks, uh, not just ransomware, but think of everything that uh, Tom has done a fantastic job explaining how, you know, our, how silence can help you. But uh, think about everybody that has ransomware. You know you have ransomware. But think about, the, think about the malicious attacks that you don't even know underneath your nose. Uh, it's the zero days that you really have to go out and attack and find a solution for. And if you haven't picked up a copy and I think the new one is going to be out here in about three more months. The Verizon data breach, uh, data breach report. I mean, just take a look at that report and look at the organizations. Um, you'll see one common thread, which is a lot of the unknowns that they had for a long period of time. I think it's somewhere like around six months uh, for those pups that ran deep uh, for a long period of time without anybody knowing who was in the organization, what they were stealing, what they, what they were doing, taking, seeing. Uh, you talk about violation. It's 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 wicked. So. So I want to make sure that everybody understands executables across the board. Uh, this is a, a true pre-execution prevention technology uh, that has taken the world by storm with what it can do uh, that has never been done before. I mean, in the cybersecurity world, this is quite incredible with the AI and ML that we've brought in. That would be artificial intelligence and machine learning. John, what else do you got? Let's go another one. Yeah, here, here, here's another, another good question. Here's another qu question coming from John. Um, he first of all says thanks for the webinar, but uh, he's talking about attackers altering the code so security firms don't flag it. So essentially, putting on a packer to turn it into a zero day is that where our artificial intelligence AV comes in? Uh, so our artificial intelligence comes in for for any executable at all. Period. Uh, what you will see, however, is that our solution is going to be vastly more effective at uh, detecting. Uh, things that have been packed. Uh, so, for example, legacy antivirus is is going to not do a very good job with packed malware. Uh, but for for Silence Protect, it's it's it, it's just as it's just as successful. It's just as effective on the, on the packed malware. So the artificial intelligence and machine learning it is applied against all executables, though. Awesome. Here, here's another question from uh, Stan Nguyen. Uh, what's a zero day? Oh, good question. So a zero day vulnerability is essentially a vulnerability where uh, typically the vendor is not going to even know it exists and there will not be a patch for it. So if a zero day is announced, so say uh, there's a zero day for uh, something like Java or Flash that's announced, uh, but there's no patch for it. That, that essentially means that you know the vendor doesn't know about it, so there's no patch, and so there's there's no time frame on you know getting a patch for 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 that particular vulnerability. Um, so or another or another another way of saying it, 
zero days are the death of traditional antivirus folks. Yeah, if, if uh, antivirus, if there's not a known, you know, vulnerability associated with it, it's very hard for security organizations to write signatures uh, or detection mechanisms for those vulnerabilities because they don't, they don't know they exist. Um, however, that, that also does not, does not matter really for Silence Protect. So it's going to look at every executable and, and feed all of those characteristics into the machine learning models and then determine if it's good or bad. Uh, so that's why we were able to be so ahead of the game with a, a one of the ransomware families such as Zcryptor, for example. So yeah, a zero-day vulnerability is basically a vulnerability that uh, the, the vendor itself doesn't know about and that no patch currently exists for it. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Uh, here's another question from Jeff. Jeff actually previously asked a question about the proportion of, of ransomware from Mac versus Windows. and. He's asking now, so, so is silence like a honeypot sitting, waiting, and there to analyze and clean? No. I mean, so it's not a honeypot because a honeypot basically is going to, uh, the purpose of a honeypot is to advertise services that uh, are not native and that are not actually on the system. You're basically, with a honeypot, you're trying to trick uh, attackers into accessing specific systems. So protect is... It, it is an it's it's an antivirus solution. It, it it exists in the same realm as as the other antivirus solutions. It just takes a significantly different approach to preventing uh, malware from running. Whereas legacy antivirus vendors are gonna you know you have to download your updates every day into your DAT files and then scan all your scan all the uh, all the executables in your environment and see if any of them are malicious. Well, with Protect you you don't have to do that. We take a significantly different approach in terms of how we prevent malware from running. And that's by utilizing artificial intelligence in machine learning. And so it doesn't act as a honeypot. It, it just acts, it, it, it exists at a very similar level as, as antivirus in terms of, you know, a shim between the, between the kernel and, and user land. So. Love it, love it. And, and by the way, everyone, thank you so much for asking all these, these great questions. We're doing our best to get to them. Um, it's awesome seeing all these questions come in. Here's another one, Tom. Has any ransomware been known to jump to USB drives? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So if you have a thumb drive connected to your uh, computer when it is infected with ransomware, there, there have been cases where uh, the thumb drive has been uh, encrypted as well. One of the first things ransomware is going to do upon successful execution is basically look around and see what other systems uh, that, that victim host is connected to whether that be network shares or thumb drives or other, other systems directly. So yeah, anything connected to that machine at the time of infection uh, has the potentiality to be encrypted, for sure. Awesome. All right, let's take one more, John, and then we're going to uh, shut her down and give people a place to go to get more uh, answers to their questions. Yeah, no, definitely. And here's a question that we see a lot, and it comes from Scott Johnston. What's the false positive ratio? Right. So, uh, last I've heard, is my understanding, is is two two per million, uh, is is what I've heard in terms of our, my understanding and what I've seen. I haven't I haven't ran into um, many false positives in, in, in using in using the product, but I believe the number is uh, two per million currently. Yeah. Another way of saying it, too, guys, um, and this is what I get from the field. It's like point zero 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 two three seven. So obviously, um, you know, if you're a, a large organization, uh, I mean, regardless, I don't care how you chop it up. It's a very small. And the one number that I want everybody to also leave with today is the efficacy. Guys, we're, we've been stopping preventing malware. Ninety nine point seven percent is the efficacy. So of course, that begs the question: what the false positive ratio is? It's the smallest in the industry, point blank. Um, so hopefully everything that you guys have learned today in terms of what ransomware is, where did it come from, what's the history, the evolution of it, what are the bad guys using, what tools, what's the business model, uh, what happens in terms of the different type of infection uh, vectors and, and all the rest of it. Hopefully we've given uh, folks here something to talk about uh, tomorrow, tomorrow at the water cooler and start uh, stimulating those minds of decision makers in your organizations that would like to do a, a proof of concept. I mean, at the end of the day, guys, you need to test the software. That's really the mantra here at Silence is just test for yourself. Trust no vendor. 
Um, right now in the industry, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of clouds. There's a lot of noise, as we call it, as to what everybody does. And so that's what you have to do at the end of the day. You have to just test it. Don't just take to take someone's someone's uh, opinion like myself. Uh, don't don't just hear what I say and say, oh, that must be what it does. You have to put your hands on it. You'll discover for yourself instead of a proof of concept what it does, how quickly it is to deploy. And of course, let's not forget about uh, the main key here is some kind of consulting. You need to have somebody that, like Tom, that can sit down with you, learn what your landscape looks like, what you currently have in terms of different layers of security, and make sure that you've used the right tools and methods in terms of a compromise assessment before you put down a new shield to protect those endpoints. And when I say endpoints, we're talking about laptops, desktops, servers, and uh, as we mentioned earlier today, protecting both Mac and Windows, and yes, also Linux as well. So. A lot of good stuff came out today, Tom. You did a fantastic job. I don't know about you, but I want to do another one of these uh, in, in the new year. So won't we try to maybe survey, poll everybody, see what they want to hear and, and learn, uh, hear us talk about in January. And uh, with that, uh, I want to make sure everybody does stand by and look for the survey that John's going to be pushing out to you. If you guys have more questions, you guys can find uh, our contact information and a whole lot of information at silence.com. That's C-Y-L-A-N-C-E, silence as in quiet, on your system. And I do appreciate everybody coming in. Tom, good job. Anything else you want to say in closing? Oh, no, just thank you, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. I know everyone is uh, in this space is super busy. So uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come and uh, listen to what we have to say.